So I think it's, it's interesting because a lot of times we always think about the British col uh, colonizing yeah. us. But we also we, 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 but we forget Germany, yeah, Germany especially in the Volta region. region especially, yes. yes, because I read a book called The Chief and C in Ghana that's focusing on the Volta region, Chief and C. And they actually said that German officials actually took the titles away from the uh, Volta um, AWA chiefs because they didn't want the AWA chiefs to have a bigger title than them. In this episode of Your Guide on Ghana, I speak to a young woman who is documenting history in Ghana. She is highlighting chieftaincy and showing us some of the meanings behind some of the symbolism of the things that we see in the chiefs' lives every day here in Ghana. Hi, my name is Ivy Prosper and today I am really excited about this episode I'm bringing you for your guide on Ghana. I'm talking to a young woman who is behind the brand Sihene and that brand shares a lot of important information about chieftaincy in Ghana, the meaning behind different things and she's really passionate about sharing this with the world, about sharing this with the diaspora, with Ghanaians, with Africans, so you can learn more about the chieftaincy in Ghana and the meanings behind different things that you may not have thought about before. And I'm really excited to sit down with her today. We are filming at Gold Coast Restaurant in Cantonments Accra. I thank them for allowing me to use this space to film this episode and other episodes I filmed here as well before. If you are in Accra and you need a place to go and eat or catch a live show, come to Gold Coast Restaurant. It is not hard to find. You can easily find it on Google Maps. Now, if you like this video, hit the like button. Don't forget to share it so you can share this content with other people. And if you haven't subscribed already, hit that subscribe button. Now, let's get into the episode. So welcome to this episode of Your Guide on Ghana. Today, I have a very interesting young woman <laughs> who is doing something that a lot of people haven't done. And it's so important when it comes to documenting the history, the culture, the heritage of Ghana. And I've been following her on social media and just love the work that she's been doing. And I thought it was very important to share this because it is a part of celebrating Africa, celebrating Ghana, and just knowing things that people don't understand. Oh yes. Because when it comes to the chieftaincy, mm -hmm. a lot of people don't really get some of the things that are done and mm -hmm. why they're being done. And yes. I know that I'm one of those people. <laughs> Um, whenever we go to events and mm -hmm. they have this derber of chiefs that yes. come in, and queen mothers, and they're holding, holding the these umbrellas. big umbrellas <laughs> spinning around, yes. I'm just like, I'm in awe of how the umbrellas look. Yep. Um, and then I wonder where everything comes from, the mm -hmm. history of it. So I would love for you to introduce yourself, yes. um, how you got into what you do. Okay. Introduce yourself and then what you do and how you got into it. Okay, perfect. Hello everyone, my name is Rita Moena Benison. I'm the founder and director of Sihenny. So Sihini is a foundation that preserves the chieftaincy and traditional culture of Ghana, um, mostly focusing on archives as our digital platform that we have on Instagram. But also I want to be able to establish something physical where people can actually go to, you know, exhibitions, talks, and actually feel maybe the umbrellas or kente cloth, but mostly historical items or artifacts that are from the early 1800s to the early 1900s. So things that you might not think about too much or you might not see, but actually present them in a physical manner. Yes. Wow, that's so, so fascinating. Now, why did you want to get into this? Yeah, so Sihani started during my graduate program, which my first year was three years ago. And so I just graduated. And so within my project, I went to University of Wisconsin-Madison and I majored in photography. And so, you know, going to school in uh, Madison, it wasn't many black students. So kind of thinking about how do, like as me as a graduate student and also a photographer, how do I capture, you know, many of the students, even if they're African or African-American, their identity. 
And so within that, you know, series, it helped me really focus on my identity as well. And I think my professors really like hound on to me like, okay, Rita, you're photographing other students, but what about yourself? <laughs> you know, who, who, who are you? Even though, yes, you know, you are Ghanaian, but you grew up majority of your life in America. And so how do you describe yourself within photographs or even within the art form to, you know, to the viewers or even to yourself? And so one thing, you know, I grew up in Michigan. And so within Michigan, a lot of, t or even the United States in general, many people, many ways that people even describe themselves as Ghanaian is because of the connection to the kente cloth. So you'll see uh, many outfits that have kente or even just Ghanaian fabrics that we ha have, or even, you know, um, waist beads or something that is just, you know, it's like that brings them to their connection to their Ghanaian identity. Even if it's something that they see that is trending or something that's brought down within the family generation. Um, so for me, I didn't really want to do like the typical things that I will see. So I was like, okay, like what can I do or what can I find that kind of connects, has a bigger connection to me? Um, so on my, for my family, um, I'm from the Volta region. And so my, my mom, from the region. oh wow, okay. Yeah, so my mom is from Busuta and then my dad is from Agbozome. And so on my mom's side, my grandfather was a traditional chief. But the story for him is that there's not many photos of him. So we really only have one photo for, oh. of him. And he passed away a few years ago. And so he was a traditional chief within the Volta region, but his like stool title is an Ashanti name. So it's the Fusu Henny. That's interesting. Yes. And so I talking to my mom, she told me that within my grandfather's lineage, we have a connection to Ejesu in the Ashanti region. We don't know exactly where, but it's somewhere <laughs> within that. And I think it's because of the war too. Um, within the Ashantis and the uh, right. A-ways. Right, a lot of people don't know that there was a war between yeah. different groups within yeah, different Ghana group, over, yes. the, over the centuries. Yes, yeah. and so that kind of made me start thinking about, okay, you know, I have this royal lineage, but I don't really know too much about it. I don't really have any archival work about it as well. And so one thing living in Madison, you know, even in the United States, we have a lot of African festivals. And so one thing Madison does, they have is, you know, the African festival and Ghana will actually showcase Ghana using the umbrellas. So yes, they will have other things, but um, the umbrellas will stand out. Yeah. And that was very like new to me because in Michigan, we would just do the typical things. You have jollof rice, have yes. kente, yes. or even like the typical African art that you'll find. Um, but then going to Madison and seeing these photos of these umbrellas, I was like, I will see them on the internet, but, or even on videos, but I never really knew why they were used what is the real meaning of it? And so as a graduate student, I had like a whole bunch of accessibilities to a lot of um, um, scholarly articles. And so a lot of the articles were from like the white perspective. So a lot of historians that would come from the United States or from Europe coming to Ghana and to record. And I felt like more of these stories were like case studies mm -hmm. because in a way they're not really engaging. They're just kind of standing from the back and saying, okay, this is what's happening. Um, and one thing I learned about the umbrellas is that they were not actually made in Ghana. So what? <laughs> yeah. What? Yeah. So, so this, this object that we used since the early 1700s was not actually made in Ghana. Are you serious? Yeah. So where was it made? So it was actually a Dutch, it was actually a gift from a Dutch governor in 1701. Oh my goodness. Yes. So you actually will see a lot of West African countries use this royal umbrella. Yes. But it was given from the Dutch because of the trading routes. So like- I'm I, in <laughs> complete shock right now. Yes. So it's a very colonial gift. But there's like many stories that even the umbrellas were here, but the, du it, the Dutch connection was still, like, it was a gift. That just, it also makes me think of a wax print fabric. Yeah, exactly. Yep, exactly. Yeah, so because of trading routes, you know, the umbrella was given as a gift to the Asante Henny, the first Asante Henny in 1701. Mm -hmm. And so me thinking about this umbrella, I'm like, okay, you know, I'm seeing this, I'm seeing this history that I'm like, okay, which also reshaped my, you know, ideas of what this object is I meaning, imagine. the materials that's used, even how it's been uh, presented within photographs, because even when I was searching for it, I would only see photographs of it within what we use within like the late 2000s. But I really had to go back to Ghana, which is kind of like my home going, um, to actually find the real history of the umbrellas. Uh, and so I, so three, like three summers ago, I was well, my first time going back to Ghana since I was a baby, and which was a, a new experience for me because Usually my perspective of Ghana was what my parents, my family, things that I see on social media, even before Instagram was big, Tumblr. 
oh, and I yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I always like have my own like inspiration board because I was an artist. So I was like, okay, what I can, what can, what photos or inspirations or even text can I use to find inspirations? And so it's actually funny now too that it's kind of like a full circle moment. Many of the photographs that even some of the, my friends that um, some of the people that I looked up to who were photographers going back to Ghana for like maybe funerals mm -hmm. who had royal lineage as well. They will, you know, post it on um, Tumblr, but now I'm actually friends with them now because as those photos were my inspirations, now like see Henny's photos are like kind of like their inspirations. Ah, yeah. So it's like see, that full. Yeah. Reposting the images. Yes. And so going back to Ghana, you know, it's my home going as well. But then it's also a moment for me just to do research. I was able to go to Kumasi and talk to many historians and they literally sat down with me for hours and just literally told me and broke down the history of the umbrella, the importance of it. And so then that got me thinking about, okay, but I have all this information, I have all this knowledge, I'm seeing this umbrella in literally in real time, which is amazing too. But where are these archives to actually get references of how did it look in the early 1800s? How did it look in, you know, you know, 1920? Um, but there wasn't there. And yeah. so they gave me some recommendations on people I should look into, professors, you know, at, professor at University of uh, Michigan, uh, Kwesi Apenny, who really focused on the Shanti region, especially with the Queen Mother's funeral. And so looking at his books and breaking down the chieftaincy in the Shanti region really made me, was like, made me, well, give me inspiration. I'm like, okay. So now how do I go back to the United States, go back to research and as, you know, as a graduate student, and find these key words that he's using in his book and kind of find these within the internet. And so literally I spent many, many hours just researching. Um, since a, as a graduate student, you have access to a lot of data ba ba uh, databases. And so literally I would spend hours and hours, I would call like Google's dark web, because even if you put Ghana's chief and see, you'll just see many um, images of just recent yes. things. Or even if it's recent, it's just about the Santi Henny and that's it. And you don't really find anything about other regions. And that's also really sad, too, because it's just like, we have the history, you know, people were coming here, but they weren't really recording as much, or they were just focusing on one particular region. Um, and so over time, I started collecting more photos, um, getting more book recommendations, finding more books. Literally, the library and the scanner were like my best friends. <laughs> Um, then COVID happened, and so we were kicked out of our art studios. Oh. <laughs> and so I had to bring all these books and all these photos, and like I had a scanner at, at my apartment in, in Madison. So I was like, okay, well, I want to continue to do my research. I'm about to graduate next year during that time. And I'm like, okay, so how do I continue to keep myself accountable on, you know, me continuing to be an artist? And, I, and without school. Because sometimes like, I didn't know if I wanted to do a PhD afterwards or where would my life be or did I want to just, you know, just be an artist. Yeah. And so I was like, okay, well, I like researching. I have all this materials. I have my computer, my phone to take photos. I have also a scanner that's not too big, but not too small. So literally I start scanning, taking photos of every single photo that I had in, within all these books. And I was like, okay, well, I use Instagram. Many people are now, because of COVID, are using Instagram. <laughs> and so I literally just started posting. Um, See Honey started in January, but it wasn't as great during that time because I, that was before COVID was really, was serious in a way. Yeah. So that's when it was, it was people- around like February, March. Yeah, that's when it like closed down, locked down. Yes. Started, yeah, closing down. So in January I started, cause I was like, okay, new year, new me but not really new me, but year, new year, new goals. <laughs> um, and so I started the page and I named it See Henny because I was like, okay, one of my photos that I took, it was two women who were um, uh, waitresses in a restaurant and I had them holding a royal umbrella. And so I was like, you know, I really want to find a way to have everyday people connect to these royal lineages or chieftaincy. Because even if we break down our culture, everything kind of starts from the chieftaincy, even the kente cloth the stool. And so I named it See Henny because I searched something about instillment. So actually See Henny means instillment. And so in a way I wanted, whatever people see my work, I want them to feel power. And so I felt that that title just meant, just made a really big statement or impact. Uh, and then like the logo is the arc. So kind of like the umbrella, but in a very minimal way. So I was like, okay, well my research, my art is about these umbrellas and I love the umbrellas. And this is where it all started. So. 
I kind of combined those two together and, and built C. Henny. But then I was also balancing school and then posting, so it wasn't too much of a too much time to do yeah, anything. Social media can be quite time consuming. Yes. Yeah. And then also too, my audience was just my friends in Madison and my friends in, in Michigan. And then sometimes the audience that might stumble upon your page or might stumble upon one photo that you post because of the hashtags. Mm -hmm. um, but then COVID hit, and then literally I was just okay. I'm like, I had all this time. Um, cause I was just taking independent studies. So it was just research time. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to post every single day or at least five times a day or five times a week. Um, and I think like COVID definitely helped because, you know, literally you will see a lot of Instagram pages turning into a digital museum, mm -hmm. even if it's not even about Ghana or even the chief and in general, yeah. but it was just a way for people just have all this time just on their phones. Mm -hmm. And so I just kind of use that as an opportunity to really just go out and do what I need to do and then bring yeah. out this history and provide this digital museum of the chief and seat in on Instagram, but for Ghanaians. Yeah. And you know, with Instagram, you're able to also pick your audiences too. So I was like, okay, for me to really, you know, have Ghana see these photos, because many of the photos that I post are not actually in Ghana. And actually Ghana doesn't own any of the photos. Yeah, you know, that's a sad part. Yes. You just mentioned about Ghana not owning the photos. Um, and this is a problem for a lot of African countries. Yeah because of the history of colonialism yes. and um, the people who were controlling the countries yes. at different periods of time, yep. having owned the content. So yes. for instance, there was a filmmaker I met from Nigeria mm -hmm. who had said the same thing, that yeah. the historical film that he was working on, he had to go to the BBC and go yeah. to the UK <laughs> yes. to get the history yep. of Nigeria. Yep. He's like, we don't even own um, our own historical yeah. information. And it's a sad thing. And he said that there was actually a place that had some, um, but it had, had been burned down. No, exactly. I think the same, uh, same thing happened here, even with our Ghana films, mm -hmm. old films that we had, they burned down. Mm -hmm. And even like some of the photos that people do share with me, a lot of the individuals are not living in Ghana. Mm -hmm. So maybe our photos that their grandfather or parents like, passed down to them. Photos. Yeah, family photos. And, and I think that's one thing that kind of changed my life with Sea Honey was like that family connection. So I guess I knew, I know that I'm posting people's family members, yeah. but I don't think it hit me at that point because I was like, okay, in a way I'm still looking at these within the historical lens. But then as it grew within like the six months, um, that's when it got really the, the big exposure. <laughs> um, people were saying like, oh, you just posted a picture of my grandfather or my grandmother or wow. my grand uncle or my uncle or my great grandfather. And so at first I was like, oh, should I stop? I, I feel uncomfortable a little bit. I'm like, do, can I actually preserve and keep the legacy running? Yes. Or am I telling the right stories? Yes. Am, am I presenting them in the right way? Because that's like a whole different pressure right. than just posting these within like, okay, I'm very passionate about this, but I'm also seeing it from like a graduate student in a historical lens than, any, than something personal. Right, I have a question. Yeah. People who reached out to you uh, saying it's their family members, mm -hmm. did you ever invite them to tell any stories about them if they knew anything about them? Yeah, so a lot of times when I was, I was going to go to Ghana, well, I was, I was in Ghana my fall semester so because of COVID, I was like, I'd rather be in Ghana to do, continue my research. Um, so during that time, I was able to actually meet some of the people and say, even if it wasn't like a full conversation, at least just to acknowledge, you know, thank you for this information or how can I learn about more, learn more. Um, even, but even with time constraint, I couldn't meet every single person or even if the conversation would, might have been really short, yeah. but at least it was like an introduction. Uh, and then too, within the historians, they saw like how much it was growing as well. So they would always invite me to funerals or any type of event, even if I couldn't or could make it. Yeah. Um, and then my co-director, Elijah Asari, uh, he's the administrator for the Ministry of Chiefancy. And so I, one thing for me, I'm very consistent with em emails. Yes. And so I, I would literally email the Ministry of Chief and see so many times. He's like, <laughs> I've been seeing your emails. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and he's like, I love, <laughs> and he's like, I love what you're doing. And then when I came to Ghana my second time, he actually helped me to go to many of the meetings, um, go to Kamasi multiple times, and just actually be more engaged. Mm -hmm. So now I was able to actually kind of meet the chiefs too and say, okay, I'm doing this project just as an introduction. Um, because I want to get to the point now that, yes, maybe the family members are now, you know, seeing who I am, my passion for it, but then the chiefs are a whole different level where I'm like, okay, I need to get their respect. 
so that they can say, okay, I do trust C. Henny to put out this story, or I have these archives and I do trust them to, you know, keep them well, or even just tell the stories of my people or of me. Um, because a lot of times I think even with the chief and C, even if we, even if we, before we think about the umbrellas, we think about the chief and C as people who are actually regular day people, <laughs> like a majority of their life, and then the time came then and they, they became a chief, chief. Yes. and then their whole story changes. Yeah. And so it is very interesting too because some of them are very private, some of them are on Instagram, but it's cool to see like some of them were actually photographers, architects. And now they became a chief, but they still has that, you know, they're passionate of what they did before. Yeah. And how do they integrate that within their chiefancy role now? Right. And so I try to find ways to just make sure I have that respect for both. That I have respect for them and also they have respect for me. So that, you know, C. Henny can be something that continues the legacy. Even if I'm not doing it anymore, that there's a team of people that they know, okay, we can provide this information to C. Henny and C. Henny will provide it to the world, especially to Ghana. Yeah. So with the chieftaincy, mm -hmm. what is something that people need to know? Because, I mean, Ghanaians are, are, are somewhat familiar with it, mm -hmm. but somebody who may be like an African-American or yeah. um, a black person in, in the UK, Europe, wherever they may be, and maybe they don't have a full knowledge of mm -hmm. what the chieftaincy role actually is. Oh, yeah. Um, do you have that? Did you learn that information with your meetings and discussions with the chiefs? Oh, yeah. I think it's a... I'm still learning. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, many of these things I'm still learning about because now I was looking at these photos like as an artist, even as a, like an anthropologist in a way, and kind of seeing from my own experience like the reason why they're wearing the, the type of textiles that they're wearing, the kente, the cloth, the jewelry, the umbrella, the reasoning for that. Um, but now that I'm back home in Ghana, um, relocated, I'm going to now dig deeper into that so then I can say, okay, this is why the chief and is important. So, because even some, I think I had like one comment, someone said, oh, the chief and C is dead. But in a way, the chief and C can never be someone dead. Said the chief and C is dead? Yeah, like, there's like, it's something that's not important. But for me, I feel like, I, I, I think I said before, like, I feel within our culture, it is rooted by it the chief. It's completely important because yes. they even have power when, like, the government makes decisions. A lot of oh, times yeah. they. Even if you're buying land. With the chiefs before they. Yeah, make or even if, you're, even if you're buying land. Yes, Simple. Yeah. You can't go and say like, um, even if you, like if a person is relocating back to Ghana, or even if Ghanaians want to buy land to build a house or just build their business. Yeah. If you're buying land on a stool land yeah. or a chief and see land, you have to get it's there's, there's three sectors. So the government, um, the chief and see um, like the chief, uh, and then the stool family. So even if the chief is not uh, is maybe not alive, you have to go through the family and say, can I use this land for this reason? Mm -hmm. And if they don't allow you, you can't. That's it. Yes. Yeah. Because yeah. easily a chief can say, oh, I don't want this here. Yeah. And say, no, I don't allow this. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's one thing people also have to consider, too. And I think, too, is just like, even if we're learning about, like, the basic things, even like the Kente, the, you know, even for graduations, the, the Kente the, the, stool. Yeah. The you know? Stool, you mean what they, yeah. everybody wears. Yeah. yeah. So there's a reason why, you know, because even the Santihini, you can't wear the same Kente as the Santihini, or any other chief can't wear the same kente, or even the umbrellas. Um, the, uh, all the umbrellas are all different. They might look the same from far away or from a distance, mm -hmm. but there are also, like, there's always these specific little designs that make it so special for that specific chief. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, why do they hold the umbrellas? What is the purpose of it? Yeah, so the main purpose is for to protect and shade the king or to shade the chief, but then also it's for an identifier. So that when you're going to these festivals or you're going to these ceremonies, there might be thousands or 500 people there. So you can't say, okay, this chief is from this place. No. So the umbrella will actually say, okay, this chief is from the central region. This chief is from the Volta region. This chief is from the Ashanti region. Okay. Because of the, the design, maybe the Adinkra symbol that that chief represents or the animal mm -hmm. or even the textiles, the colors. Yeah, there's a folk tale that says... Um, the umbrella blocks um, blocks what the chief is thinking from God. So if the, um, if, the, if the chief or the person is under the umbrella, God can't like know what the person is thinking. So I don't know if it's true or not, but that's, that's what I was told. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Like, why would they not want God to hear? What are they thinking? I don't know. <laughs> yes. You know? But and also, um, just like you know, the footsteps and the movements that they the chiefs do to communicate to the people, mm -hmm. or just within the moment or the ceremony, uh, the purpose of the ceremony. The umbrella actually mimics the footsteps of the chief. 
So if their chief is dancing, you'll see the the, the umbrella moving up and down. Yes. Not just to like shade the chief, but also to mimic yes. the movement of the chief. Now that you steps. say that, I'm thinking about it. And yes, I actually, I was recently in Tamale at the Damba Festival. Mm -hmm. And there was a chief that was coming in. And then he was like moving around like this, like yep. he was dancing. And, and then the, um, the way yep. that they were yep. spinning the umbrella. Yes. Now that I think about it, it was connected to him moving. Yes. That's interesting. Yeah, So, and that's why I feel like the umbrella, like I have so much passion for it because we think, we, when we look at the umbrella, it's just like, even in the United States, it's just like a regular thing. But in New Orleans, it's something that, it's for celebration. Yeah, somebody has said that when they came to Ghana, yes, and they saw the way funerals were happening, mm -hmm. happening, they said they recognized some of the things Ghanaians do being similar to, to things people uh, yeah. in New Orleans are doing. It's very true. Which kind of shows you that the that connection, connection. yeah, the African connection, yeah. of history and ancestry. Yeah. So even like like I said, like the symbol object as an umbrella has such a bigger meaning which I kind of feel that we don't really appreciate as much or value as much because it's just like, in a way we're just like, oh, it's just something that protects the chief or shades the chief from, from the sun. But it has such a bigger meaning and purpose within the chief and sea because even if you're going or if you're meeting the chief, you already know this chief is a bigger, higher, has a bigger hierarchy within maybe if he's seated or standing next to maybe five other chiefs because of the size of the umbrella and then the design, mm -hmm. you know. And so even if the chief is sitting down at a house, you can walk in and you know this is a chief because he has a medium-sized umbrella while maybe just, even if it's you meeting the Asante Henny, he'll just have a regular-sized umbrella and you will sit. So you know like an, an outside person will come in and like, okay, this person under the umbrella is the chief yeah. or is the king. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And so with what you're doing right now, I'm sure that it's taking, I mean, there's resources involved in doing mm -hmm. this. Do you have any support or are you looking for support with this yes. project to keep it ongoing and how can people support you? Uh, yes. you um, so a lot of people, ways that people are able to support is even just if they have chief and see photos or family photos of royal lineage within their families and if they want to be able to, you know, they have them in their photo albums. So they're like, okay, I have all this information. I might not know too much about it. You know, you can bring email them to um, information, uh, info at cheney.com and so then in a way, I can try to dig deeper within those photos and see, okay, even if it's not a specific name, I can try my best and see, okay, where are those connections? And then also, you know, that will also kind of dig deeper about a chief because even the photos that I post, many of the information is not there. The yeah. names are not there. Even sometimes the regions are spelled wrong. And, um, or they'll just say, oh, like African chief or, yeah. I yeah. see that sometimes you see African chief on something and you're like, well, which country, which, yes. which area? Yes. Which or yeah. they'll just say like Gold Coast because yeah. during that time, you know, Ghana was the Gold Coast. Right. And so it's not nothing descriptive. But one thing that definitely helps is if someone actually has a name and then I could actually connect those those photos to another photo or even to a video. Mm -hmm. And that definitely helps. But other ways is that, you know, my goal is to have a, to establish a Sea Henny Museum and Research Center. Um, just because, you know, mostly in general, Sea Henny, I feel like Sea Henny would be a great museum for people to have a building that's mostly just focused on the chief and sea and tradition, um, because yes, we have other museums that are focusing on other items, but if it's just something where it's just even just breaking down the layers of the chief and sea is so important, because at least it will give um, even ourselves an identity foundation of why are these items that we see every single day, we use on a daily basis so important within our um, culture, and then even our heritage and see like, okay, this is why this brings me power. This is why I call myself a Ghanaian. This is why I am from Ghana. But if you don't have that, if you don't see it, it's just like, okay, I know that I'm Ghanaian, but why? Yeah. You know, what brings me that power and strength within my identity? And then a research center, because even for me, I mean, I can't even say for students in Ghana, but for me coming to Ghana and not really having resources to say, okay, I'm doing this research, but where do I go to? And even the places that might be available, they're not always going to be open. And then also, too, the materials that they, might, they have might be very old that they might be not preserved right, you know, and I think preservation is very important. And I think that's something that even this on the continent in general, not, not just in Ghana, is something that we slowly have to relearn how to preserve our culture because we can't just leave a photo out and say like, oh yeah, this is gonna last a, a million years yeah. or whatever, or even having an artifact. Even, you know, a lot of countries are now saying, bring these artifacts back. Um, and also I do believe in that, but in the first, my thing is that I felt that we need to establish places or buildings or rooms where we can actually hold these artifacts, you know? Because if we don't, 
you know, the next 20 years from now, the artifacts are going to be gone. And maybe that's what Ghana wants, that yes, our history will be here until it's ready to go, or our history will be here until we can actually keep it to continue. Um, so I really want to be able to build a research center where people, even if it's students here, students abroad, can actually come to Ghana or come to this research center and actually find research, have these equipment that actually will provide them. And especially with you know, how I was able to use a lot of these databases from museums from United, um, in the United States and, U and Europe, um, but also just these databases from um, even Germany, um, the Basel Mission Archives. They have one of the largest Ghanaian archives within the chiefancy and in Ghana in general. In Germany. In Germany. So I think it's, it's interesting because a lot of times we always think about the British col uh, colonizing yeah. us, but we also we, we, but we forget things. Germany, yeah, Germany, especially in the, the Volta region. region especially, yes. yes, because I read a book called The Chiefancy in Ghana that's focusing on the Volta region chiefancy. And they actually said that German officials actually took the titles away from the uh, Volta um, Awe chiefs because they didn't want the Awe chiefs to have a bigger title than them. And so that actually makes sense why many of the archives in, in the Volta region are not found or not accessible because even if you want to look up a title, that person might have had their title taken away because of the Germans. I just want you to be able to get the support that you need. Yes. So I hope that people really are as fascinated by some of oh, the yeah. research today as I am. Yes. Um, and I think it's great that you want to build a research center. It's great that we should we should have a museum dedicated yeah. to the chieftaincy because it's such an important part of yeah. Ghanaian culture and society as yes. a whole. Yeah. So I think that your idea is brilliant. Yes. And I hope that you do get the support that you need. Thank you. Um, I'm thinking you probably have connected with the National Commission on Culture yeah. probably on, yeah. a few, on a few things. Um, but you do need yes. space. Yes. Have you been looking for places yet? Oh, what? yeah. So my goal is to be able to write. It's a, it's a big goal, but my goal is to raise $10 million. Because, $10 million. Because even if you think about museums and research centers, that's how much that's it literally much, yeah. costs yeah. to even just make it run. Yeah. Um, and then also, um, but at first, I want to be able to raise $500,000 just for me to be able to rent out a place just so that we have a structure. Mm -hmm. So then, because one thing, I learned is that maybe in Ghana, museums are not known. I mean, like, yes, we have them, but it's not something that people, people will go to. Them. Yes. So if, at least if I can provide a space where people can actually say, like, oh, OK, this is a possibility. I can see what Sihani can offer to Ghana and to my children, to my, my grandparents, to me, you know, and see, like, the progress. Brilliant. Thank you're you. You're doing amazing things. I'm proud of you for what you're doing. Thank I you. I always love seeing um, young black African Yes. Everybody, like black people in the diaspora, uh, being able to come back and do something that they're passionate about and, and make an impact. You're trailblazing. <laughs> I try. <laughs> You're trailblazing because yes. we don't have anything yeah. that is documenting the chieftaincy. Yeah. So, um, and then you're also adding other parts of history as well. Oh, yes. Yeah. Everything is interconnected. So. I commend you for what you're doing. Thank you. Um, and I implore you to support what she is doing here. Yes. It's <laughs> she wants to raise $500,000 mm -hmm. to get started, to have a space to rent so that she can have a centralized place people can come to yeah. visit yes. and, um, and just have some structure. Oh, yes. Um, and then the long-term goal, $10 million to have a place that's built specifically oh, as yeah. a museum, yeah. as a place that you can um, have people come and visit. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, your website again, Instagram handle, yes. so they can get in touch with you. Yeah, so um, our website is Sihene, so S-I-H-E-N-E dot -E com, and then Instagram is Sihene, S-I period H-E-N-E. -E. Help Rita reach her goal of establishing an official Sihene Museum in Ghana. Visit the GoFundMe page and make your contribution to help her reach this goal of bringing the culture to the world. If you can't make a donation, then simply share the information and someone who can, can help support the cause. We're sitting here at Gold Coast Restaurant. I thank them for allowing me to film here in this space. If you're ever in Ghana and looking for a place to eat, yes. you can come to Gold Coast Restaurant. They also have um, live events. They have a stage where they have performances. They have live bands. They have karaoke that happens here. It's like Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. They have different events that happen here. So if you're in Ghana, you can come to Gold Coast Restaurant and check it out. So thank you so much for watching. If you like this episode, don't forget to share it with other people so they can also learn, like this video, 
And if you haven't subscribed to my channel already, hit the subscribe button. Yes. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye. <laughs>